and we all, you know, they can come to the camp and we've got free hot food all day, so they can come down. We will leave it there. Thank you very much. That would save on the food bill, wouldn't it? Yeah. Let's take a look at the papers um, this morning. St Paul's Cathedral actually making the front page of the Times. Um, a picture here of the doors being shut. Of course, they've been shut for the first time since the Blitz. Um, the lead story, though, um, our top story as well this morning, um, Gaddafi's killer, you can have him now. Um, there are some details now of the person who is accused of shooting um, Colonel Gaddafi, apparently with his own favoured golden gun. A young man has been um, named by an official close to the new Libyan government. Uh, front page of Daily Telegraph, uh, women ignored by the coalition, says WI. WI has quite a lot of weight and, and uh, traditionally have always given politicians a little uncomfortable ride. They're having a, a go at the coalition. Picture there, of course, of the Queen. She's on her tour of Australia. Um, let's take a look at the Daily Mail. Actually, this is going to be the first story that our reviewer, Phil Hall, is going to talk about. Don't drink on three days of the week. Now, the former News of the World editor, Phil Hall, has taken a look at this. He's a media consultant as well, and this has certainly caught your eye. Well, it's caught my eye because it's one of those stories that runs almost every week in the, in the newspapers. I think um, they took about, uh, I've read certainly, you drink a glass of red wine every day, it's good for your heart. They took about, should you drink during pregnancy? They've always said no, and then there was a, a change of opinion on that too. And I think this is, this is very significant. It's coming from the Royal College of Physicians, and they're saying it's not about necessarily how much you drink, it's how often you drink. And they're suggesting that at least three days a week, couples, people, particularly the elderly, should not touch alcohol because... Particularly the, liver, the elderly? Are they particularly the, the elderly, they're saying they're particularly at risk because their liver needs time to recover. Right. And I think it's, in, it's the inconsistency in the messages that come from the different uh, health authorities that, that cause concern. And I think this is why the Daily Mail are, are sort of uh, are highlighting it. It's, it's one of those one areas of escape, a, a glass of wine in the evening, but they're saying... You can eat, you can drink in moderation, but if you drink every day, it's equally dangerous. People don't like being told what to eat or drink, do they? But at the same time, if if the health authorities don't do that, they're accused of not doing their job mm. properly. Absolutely, and and, it's, and also the sheer cost of uh, treating people with, with uh, liver conditions and conditions caused by drinking uh, is something they have to address. Uh, now, Phil, you're going to pick up on the issue of uh, St Paul's. It's, this is in the Times, isn't it? The Times. I, I just think the point they make is is is, is well said, really, that uh, the protest may be justified and absolutely. We, we all agree in the freedom to protest it's a vital part of our democracy but if, you, if you're protesting effectively against a stock exchange and against bankers why are you protesting on the steps of a church and uh, what, the t what the times are saying is really that having so reflective they are passionate democrats they claim to be they should leave st paul's in peace and instead devote such energy and talent as they possess tools improving the world in more practical ways. They're just saying that the church is the wrong place to protest, which I think the point is the same point as you were making to your previous guest. Although they have said, as we just heard a moment ago, you know, they're in a, they, they hopefully they think they're in a dialogue situation, so that could change. But okay. we will see. We'll see. Um, there was a shareholder meeting yesterday, wasn't there, of um, News International, News Corporation, and um, there were some calls, perhaps, from some very angry shareholders since the um, phone hacking scandal that the Murdochs should be off the board. I think and it's interesting here because The Guardian have, uh, I think, done a great service to investigative journalism and to journalism as a whole in their investigation of, of uh, the news of the world and its, and its ills and the phone hacking. They were absolutely right to expose it. But I think sometimes there's a danger in these stories that you just go too far. And, you, you know, I don't think you can really question Rupert Murdoch's business acumen. And he said yesterday uh, that the companies faced understandable scrutiny but unfair attack. And I, I think he's got a point, really. I mean, he, the, the, the company's showing increased profits. They're a huge success. He started the company with one newspaper in Australia. It's now a worldwide uh, conglomeration, which is very successful. And I, actually, when you look at the shareholders, I was watching it live on the Guardian website last night, and actually most of the shareholders were backing him. There are a couple of, um, I think, church investors who were saying that actually they don't feel, feel comfortable uh, backing News Corporation. But actually, I think he made a very strident defence of his position when yesterday. When you were um, at the News of the World, how much of a driving force was he? How much, how much did you feel his presence? I have to say, I think that's one of the issues. He was a huge driving force when I was there. He, he never questioned the, uh, the content of the paper. But he did question, he, he was very, very strong on governance. So he would be on the phone every single week. I spoke to him every week for five years. And he would come on and he would he want to know what was the public interest in, in a particular story, what was the justification in running something, were we being too heavy-handed? So he looked all the way around, and I'm told over the last 10 years that uh, that influence has disappeared as his, as his uh, organisation got bigger. And the thing about Murdoch is he's an editor at heart, and he mm. understands the editorial issues and, and values that, that he likes to instil across his, uh, 
these newspapers. Uh, Phil, that's us done for time for now, but I know you're back in an hour, so uh, we'll Will, are, are you, you were going to talk about Libya and this sort of prospect of possibly big business to be done out there. So, uh, opportunities. an hour's time. Thank you very much. Of course, Thank Phil, you. Thanks. Coming up in the next half hour, there's a sport with no boundaries. We find out about the game of... Thanks, Liam. Uh, we're going to have a look at the papers now. Media consultant, former News of the World editor Phil Hall is here with us. Good morning. We're going to dive straight in this morning. Uh, and you're picking up on these uh, comments yesterday. This is uh, Phil, uh, Philip Hammond's comments, Defence Secretary, about um, Libya and, and what lies there in terms of uh, British interests. So, and, and, this, the, and some people are suggesting, of course, that in a way Libya owes us. Uh, well, that's something that, you know, officially is denied absolutely. I think the papers are implying that and also you become aware looking back that sometimes that some of the diplomacy and the statements that were made during the war, if it was a war, uh, rather than a rescue uh, operation, then um, you, p the positioning is very important for what happens afterwards because clearly there are massive, massive uh, opportunities there for British companies and apparently we've already been out there. Lord Green, the Trade Minister, last month visited Lib Libya to meet the National Transition Council accompanied by executives from companies including BP and Shell. The Italian and uh, French businesses apparently competing for the work and uh, clearly we're going to be making a, a, a case for, for the British business on the basis that we've spent a great deal of money trying to back the, uh, the freedom fighters. There's an element, always, uh, there's an element of cynicism about, you know, is that what it's really all about? Well, you know, you, you, there are other countries we don't go into and is that the reason? And you do wonder, don't you? And I, I think sometimes because of the oil and because of the uh, strategic position of Libya, clearly it has, uh, it has attractions. But I think... One of the rather strangest stories, Simon Calder, who's, Calder, who's a regular of this parish, writing in The Independent, says actually it's a, it's a great travel uh, opportunity as well. I'm not sure I would be seeing uh, it as a tourist. Yeah, I would I have wonder to say. about the safety element because, you know, we were just talking earlier to an expert yeah. who was saying actually many of the groups in charge of various regions aren't cohesively managed no. by the NTC, the National Transitional Council, just yet. But Simon knows what he's talking about, and he says, you know, there's a real interest in being one of the first tourists into an area that's suddenly opening up, and I guess there's going to be a sort of curiosity value as well in Libya, but, uh, but it's, it's not going to be it's not going to be a family destination, that's well, for sure. Well, I mean, the what thing with uh, Libya, of course, is as uh, Simon, who's going to be, he, he's actually here a little later mm. this morning, he can tell us a little more maybe then, but it has amazing resources. You talk it about does. the oil already, but in terms of natural, its, uh, natural yeah. architecture, its history, its heritage, Absolutely. which were, people would flock to, and, and there's I think no it's question. Been forgotten because we've seen these very disturbing pictures of sort of you know rob, uh, sort of mob rule and demolished buildings. So I think you do forget the heritage is there. Uh, from the Daily Telegraph. This is a fascinating story. Robotic skeleton allows paraplegic to walk again. This suit was designed by the Americans to help the army. Uh, they thought it would give the army, uh, the soldiers, sort of more uh, durability in the battlefield. And, and what it is, it's a, it's a suit that actually is controlled by your own nerve, nervous system. So it connects to the human nervous system and, and then directs the feet uh, or the mechanics to, to, to move. So this uh, young lady was testing it out yesterday. It's now being made, made available to uh, disabled people. I mean, obviously, it's going to be very expensive initially. But it just shows that where, where technology is going and actually, as I say, developed by the Americans for, the, for their army initially. Amazing. Um, let's talk about this beauty spot. <laughs> beauty spot invaded by A blob by from blog. outer space. Now, who's come up with that theory? I don't know. Probably the local tourist office, I would think. But uh, these blobs have been appearing in the Lake District uh, over recent months. And uh, they're saying that they, they believe it could be potentially from outer space. Apparently that was the theory uh, once before when it happened back in the 1950s and I do remember vaguely a film being made called The Blob yep, was which was based blob. on that uh, uh, on that incident but they're, they're saying there's this sort of jelly that's appearing in the, in the Lake District there's, there's some experts are saying it's it could be a result of unusual decomposition of, fr of frogs and toads but the locals say they don't believe that they just think it's unexplainable so it is true that it is dropping from the sky could I mean that, that part of the story is, is factual why or what forms it or what it's uh, you know based from we just don't know but it, do it is dropping from the sky and uh, I think you'll get tourists flocking there this weekend to try and see it. Well, any editor will know that the words blob from outer space <laughs> can't go wrong, can you? You've got a front page splash coming that way, haven't wrong. you? What a bad um, day. Stone roses, now. This yeah, two parks pop me stories. back to my youth. Well, I think two pop stories. One is we love a reunion in this country, of don't course. we? Stone roses sold out in 14 minutes yesterday, which is phenomenal, I think. Tickets selling at £55 a head, so they're not cheap. At the same time, the papers are, re are reporting that uh, 
Robbie Williams has now left the, the take that to reunion. Again? He's, again, he signed a, apparently this, uh, the huge success of their recent album has uh, you know, given a rebirth to Robbie, he signed a solo contract, but his new album is going to be produced by Gary Barlow. So I think your, your so slight cynicism again, I, I suspect they'll be back together again for another again. reunion. But again. Uh, you know, clearly reunions and, and the old bands of uh, finding new life in, uh, in, in reunions. Uh, Gary Barlow, uh, have you got a thought on X Factor, better or worse than it used to be? I think it's interesting actually. I think you should never forget that Simon Cowell is, is the arch player of PR and I think what he was very, very good at when he was here was stoking up real antipathy between the contestants and the judges. And actually X Factor doesn't really take off into the last six weeks. So I think they're building up and they're trying to get everybody's oh Gary's terrible. I don't know about you, they're but my family watched Gary Barlow and think he's fantastic. They're doing so a good job of it because we're talking are. about it later anyway. It's a great PR game. <laughs> uh, Phil, thank you very much. Thank I'll you. I'll see you this morning. In fact, let's talk about it now. For years it's been a staple of Saturday.